بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والنجم إذا هوى ما ضل صاحبكم وما روى الله عليه وسلم الحمد لله الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونؤمن به ونتوكل عليه ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له ونشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد ان سيدنا ونبينا محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله تبارك وتعالى عليه وعلى اله وصحبه وبارك وسلم تسليما كثيرا كثيرا اما بعد فاعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم قل اطيعوا الله والرسول فَإِن تَوَلَّوْا فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يُحِبُّ الْكَافِرِينَ وَقَالَ اللَّهُ تَعَالَى مَن يُطِعِ الرَّسُولَ فَقَدْ أَطَاعَ اللَّهَ وَمَن تَوَلَّى فَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ عَلَيْهِمْ حَفِيظًا صدق الله العظيم We were discussing a day in the life of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam The person that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose as uswatun hasana for all mankind The best example Whatever you want to do, look for the example of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, how he did or how he would do something like this. Do it in that manner. Do it in that way and you would be performing at the highest level mankind ever can perform. Be it akhlaq or ibadah. Personal life, developing personality, family life, our treatments with people, how do we interact, how do we respond, how we talk, and then our ibadah. In everything, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala set Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as uswatun hasana, the best example for all of mankind. And then he made that announcement. وَإِن تُطِيعُهُ تَهْتَدُ If you obey him, you will be rightly guided. This is of course in addition to لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ uswatun hasana. You have the best, best example in Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam for you. So we are talking about Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's day. If you were, if we were with him and spent a day with him, what we would find him doing, doing at that time? We talked about his mornings. After Fajr, he used to sit in the masjid doing the dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this was the time when he would do a long dhikr, 
then long du'as, and he would remain there till Ishraq, perform Salat al-Duha, and then he used to go home, ask his wives if there is anything to eat, if there was something to eat, he would have his breakfast, mostly some date and milk. And if there is nothing to eat, doesn't even have some dates and milk in the house, then he will say, Inni idal lasaim. In that case, then I'm fasting today. And then he would fast for the day. Then Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would go back to the masjid. And this was the time when all the people of Sufa, the first institution in the history of Islam, when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam built his masjid, he wanted to inform people the importance of education. And therefore, as he built the masjid, he built an area at the back of the masjid that was known as a sufa It was a bit higher place where those who would be interested in learning deen, devoted, devoting their lives for learning the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they would come and say, stay there. They, that will be where they would reside. They would live there. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to spend most of his time educating these people. There were over 300 people in a sufa altogether who devoted themselves for learning the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. These people would not go to work. They would not go back home. They would stay there. Yes, maybe at certain occasions as we may call it our holiday system, they would go home. Was it their families? Rest of the time, they're just staying over there. Just as we know, Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu is a good example of a people of Sufa. And there were many more. So now at this time, after having his breakfast, he would come back to the masjid and sit in the masjid, educating the people. Mostly, of course, the class registered people, we can say in that class are the people of Sufa. Rest of the people of Medina Munawwara, they would attend these classes according to their schedules. So it's just like having an institution where we have students that are registered and those who are busy with their work and other activities, whenever they have time, they come and take some classes, they attend some sit in some of the classes where they would learn some hadith, some fiqh, some tafsir and other things about deen. The least is they would come and have some time in the company of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And this was the time when the people of Medina would know that we would find Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the masjid. So if anyone has any concern, anything that he wants to consult Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam about, be it about his personal life, counseling, or some other important issues that the person wants to talk to Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam about, they would come and see Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam there. It was during this time that people of Medina would bring their newborns, infants, and sometimes sick children to Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam so that he would bring, make dua for them and he would recite something and blow on them. And depend on the situation, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to treat those situations. For the newborns, he used to do something that we know as tahniq. What is tahniq? It's sunnah. When the child is born, that you get a pious person, of course, in that time they had Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, who would chew on something sweet like a date, normally date, and then he would put it in the child's mouth for the child to lick from that. And that they used to try to have it on the first day the child is born. <laughs> Why is this being done and what is it that we learn from this? Subhanallah. Things that we waited for over a thousand years to learn from our research and finding. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is teaching us those things through simple actions that he's doing. That everything this child consumes, 
is going to have an effect on this child's life. Now we know that not only after birth, even before the child is born, mothers cannot take certain medications, certain type of food. There are certain things they can't eat. Why? Is it because of the mother only? No. It's going to affect the child. It's going to affect the fetus. After that, when the child is born, mothers are, are feeding their children, breastfeeding the children. We know that there are things where they have to be careful about of what they eat. It's going to have an effect. And this is what Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is teaching us through this beautiful teaching. That when he would choose something and he would apply it in the child's mouth and the child is eating that, is going to have that good effect from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam on the child. Someone, may Allah protect, just so that we understand the example, someone is drinking alcohol. And then he picks up a glass of water and he drinks some water. Won't we see effect of alcohol in the water? Because there was alcohol in his water, in his, in his mouth. And when he was drinking from this glass, there will be some effect of that alcohol in the water. If a person is doing the dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and someone like Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was constantly reciting the Quran doing the dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he would drink from the water, don't we think that effect will be in that water too? This is the effect. In fact, read our history. Sahabiyat, tabi'iyat, throughout the history. Mothers, when they used to feed their children, they used to feed them standing with the name of Allah, Bismillah. Just like when I stand my own meal on the name of Allah, they used to start feeding their children with Bismillah. And throughout the time, as they are feeding their children, they would keep on doing the dhikr of Allah, recite some Quran. And therefore, later on children used to have that effect, and they would be very connected to Quran. We find this fact in the history, that when children, infants used to cry at night time, parents used to recite Quran and children will go to sleep. Because this was something that child was fed from the childhood, from the time he or she was born. And they kept on hearing their mothers reciting Quran, reciting Quran and doing the dhikr. They felt comfort with this recitation. So now when they're disturbed and Quran is being recited, they feel comforted by, the, by, the, by hearing the recitation of Quran. We read about great mothers like the mother of Imam Shafi, Imam Malik, Imam Ahmad bin Hanbal and many others. History speaks about it. It's another topic. It's a detailed topic. But it's really something very important that we learn parenting. We learn before as we get married. We learn what is our responsibility towards our children and what things could have effect on our children. How could we re raise a race that become the leaders of the world? That will be people who would be of high caliber, great performance, high achievements. Mothers, when they used to feed their children, as children would cry, they're feeding them. And throughout the time, they are doing the dhikr, they are doing dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to use their children for the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Imam Bukhari rahimahullah, as we know, born blind, born blind. The mother every day making dua. And what dua is she making? It's not only Ya Allah, how is he going to survive? There is no one that's going to take care of him after me. And he's an orphan father died before he was born. No, her dua was Ya Allah. My intention was that I would make my son to become a scholar of Islam. Someone who would serve your deen. But he's blind. Ya Allah, grant him his eyesight 
so I can fulfill my wish about my son. And he becomes a scholar of deen. Six years, six years continuously she's making this dua. Never gave up. She never thought, no, this cannot happen. And if this did not, she did not see, if she would not have seen the result in six years, she would have continued making dua. But after six years, one day she sees in her dream, Sayyidina Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam came in her dream and he wiped his hand over the face of Imam Bukhari rahimahullah as he was sleeping, six year old boy sleeping and he wiped his hand over his face and she sees in her dream that he got his eyesight back. She woke, she woke up right away, she wakes her son up and he sees his mother for the first time. This is the Hajj time. She performs salah for the rest of the night, thanking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, salat al-shukr, after fajr, son, I made dua for all of these years, so that you get your eyesight, so that you learn the deen of Allah. At fajr time, go to the masjid now, attend the classes in the masjid. And this is how we got a person named Imam Bukhari, rahimahullah. Who in the world doesn't know Imam Bukhari? But in reality, we got Imam Bukhari through his mother. Otherwise, there could be, have been a lot of other children at that time. But we got this boy through his mother. So the mothers used to feed their children when they're crying, making dua. Ya Allah, accept him for his deen, for your deen. Accept him for the service of your deen. And today, we feed our children so that they go to sleep. They produce leaders, we are producing ummah that is sleeping. Because that's our intention. Feed them so they go to sleep. They're disturbing us too much. That's all we care about. Give them some game boys. Some game, some type of games. Keep them in front of the screen, babysitting. Mothers are feeding their children. And they're watching a movie. Pass of time, what else can we do? It takes all of my time, so I have to watch some movies. And therefore, actors, singers are being produced. We are feeding them that in the childhood. Not only food, not only this food, everything the child hears will have an effect on the child's life too. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam gave us that lesson also subhanallah through his beautiful teaching, that when the child is born, what is the first responsibility? Call adhan in the ear of the child. How much reward do I get for that? Hadith doesn't mention any reward for that. Why? Because this is not forgetting the reward. This is fulfilling your responsibility towards your child. So you understand anything your child will hear from now on will have a great effect on child's life. Make sure be very careful of what you want your child to hear. And after that first adhan, as we know it is sunnah, I don't know how long our children have to wait to hear Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar again. And this is what Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is teaching us here. Amazing, beautiful teachings that seem to be so simple, but what a great lesson and a great effect on our children's life. As I said, there is a lot in this topic that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam have taught us and educated us, educated us about. Mostly we don't pay attention to it, but it's something that we should really learn. Especially as parents, expecting parents, may even be grandparents. We need to learn this so we make sure we fulfill our responsibility towards our children. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, many of the times as he's sitting there with Sahaba Ridwanullahi alayhi majma'een, he would just sit quietly and do the dhikr of Allah. This was also something he wanted to, them to learn. To sit in the masjid and just keep on doing the dhikr of Allah. And as Sahaba Ridwanullahi alayhi majma'een tell us, that sometime, we used to count Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam doing istighfar 70 times. Sometime we would count, he did it 100 times. And he's doing different type of adhkar. So it's a quiet gathering. 
They're sitting around Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He's not saying anything. He's not teaching anything by words of mouth. But he's teaching something by his own action that sometimes you sit together in the masjid and everyone keep on doing istighfar. We may think, I wish I could do something like this. If I had the time of sitting in the masjid in the mornings and doing the dhikr and all of that, I would do it. But I don't have time. That's true. Sahaba Ridwanullahi alayhi majma'een who are busy, they used to do their own work. They would not attend this gathering. It's not that everyone is required to leave his work and come and sit. But at the same time, we should not think that because Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was free, nothing to do at this time, so therefore he would come and sit over there. Remember, this is part of his job. This is his work. And this is something that he's doing because it's something that needs to be done for the ummah. We look at the imams sitting in the masjid for a few hours because he has nothing else to do. That's our mentality. Then when you have... when. You, you have nothing else to do, then you sit in the masjid. Otherwise, if you have something better to do, then you better do that. It's a mentality. During the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam now, this was also a norm. As Umar radiallahu anhu told us, and the hadith is on Sahih al-Bukhari, he says, I had a neighbor, so me and my neighbor agreed that we would divide our days. One day, he would go to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa gatherings, these gatherings, when he would learn from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa and I would go to work. And, and, the, and the next day, then I would go to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa gatherings, and he would go to work. So in simple words, two people taking one job. And then they are alternating. Each day one person is working, the other person would attend the gathering of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. In the evening, they both will sit together. And this person will teach the other one everything he learned throughout the day from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This is not the end of it. They both will go home. And both would educate their families about everything they learned for that day. Then they will have their dinner. A young man came to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. His brother had joined the people of Sufa. We just talked about Sufa. His brother had joined the people of Sufa. What does that mean? He's always sitting in the masjid and trying to learn the deen from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He's spending his time in the company of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So the brother comes He says, Ya Rasulullah, could you please talk to my brother that's sitting here? He said, what's the matter? He said, he doesn't do anything. He's just sitting. I'm the one that's working. But, and he doesn't do anything. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, you don't have time to come and sit. I don't see you here at all. You don't have time for this. So at least your brother is learning. Do you know that when you go to work, Allah is opening the doors of risk and more avenues for your income through your brother that is sitting here and learning the deen of Allah? You stop him from doing this, Allah will, oh, will close the doors of risk for you too. It's not that he's not doing anything. He's doing a lot here too. It's a mentality. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Give us tawfiq to appreciate our deen. And understand the value of our deen. And we devote some time for learning our deen. <laughs>